Hello, photographers. My name is Spiros Heniatis, and this is where I answer your photography questions. We know about photography together, and it's Thursday, which means it's Q&A day, and we're jumping right into it with a question that came from Napa Skaters, and Napa Skaters wants to know, how do we do nighttime star photography? Now, it depends on what kind of nighttime star photography you want to do. I've actually got some videos right here at this link that you can watch to learn about one particular type of nighttime photography, which would be taking a photo of the sky with the stars showing and shining brightly. And that's one basic type, which basically just amounts to figuring out your settings, your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO to get a proper exposure of the stars. And it's not terribly difficult to do that. The other type of nighttime photography that Napa stars might be referring to is how to do star trail photos where you see the lines of light in the sky from the stars moving as the earth turns. So really what's happening is the earth is turning and the camera is moving in relation to the stars. But the point is you get those beautiful star trails, which can be a really cool type of photo. Now to do that, traditionally with film, what you would do is you would take your camera and you would use a shutter release cable. And that cable allows you to lock the shutter open using the bulb mode on the camera for the shutter speed. And what that means is as long as the shutter button is held down, the shutter stays open. So you might take an hour or two hour long exposure with the camera and as the earth moves the stars will streak across the sky giving you these light trails in your photo. Now with DSLRs we actually have a better option than taking a two hour long exposure. What you can do is set up the camera on a tripod just like you would for a two hour exposure and you're still going to shoot for an hour or two hours or however long you want to do it but instead of one photo over that entire period of time what you're going to do is take a sequence of 30 second photos. Now you could use an intervalometer, which is a tool that allows you to program how often the camera takes a photo and how many photos it will take in a row. You can do that and intervalometers aren't terribly expensive, but it's also just as easy to do by setting your settings and then putting the camera into burst mode and then using your shutter lock on your camera remote to lock the shutter down, which will just have the camera continuously taking 30 second photos one right after the other. So when you're doing this kind of a photo, this star trail type of photo, which I'll do a fuller tutorial on, what you need to do is set your settings to expose for the sky and capture the motion of the stars as much as possible, which means you wanna set your shutter speed to 30 seconds because you want that streaking in the sky. You want as much of it as you can get per exposure. And then you're gonna set your aperture wide open because you don't really need to have a closed down aperture when you're shooting out to the sky. You're effectively shooting at the hyperfocal distance or at infinity, which means that depth of field doesn't really matter in the shot. Now, if you want to shoot at the sweet spot on your lens, then you might close your lens down to like f5.6 or f8 or whatever it happens to be for your camera. But if you do that, you might have to end up boosting your ISO up to compensate for the smaller aperture. Because when you're shooting the stars, those stars are not super duper duper bright. And so you're gonna want to be able to capture as much light as possible. Now, the aperture and the ISO settings are going to depend upon how bright the stars are where you are. So I can't tell you, set your aperture wide open and set your ISO to 100, set it for 30 seconds on a shutter speed and just shoot. You'll need to tweak it out to figure out exactly where you want it for your photos and your exposure, but the key is having your shutter speed set to 30 seconds. Now, after you've taken the sequence of photos for however long you're going to take them, what you do is use a piece of software to combine them all together. And there are some great free options that I will link to down in the description. Now our next question is actually a comment that comes from Christopher Sears who says, do you think that John Resnick meant to ask about locking the exposure instead of locking the aperture? Because locking the exposure would make more sense with the first part about back button focusing. And what he's referring to is a question that John Resnick asked in this video right here where he says he's shooting with the D7000 and he's using the back button focus, but he says, how do I lock the aperture? Now I talked about how to lock the aperture in that video and I also refer to locking or setting your exposure. If John meant to lock exposure versus locking aperture, that's a really great question and it does make more sense. When you hit your focus button on your camera, typically what happens is 
you also activate the meter and tell the meter to start reading the scene to give you an exposure reading on the camera. Now, if you use spot metering, whenever the camera is metering, it is metering off the single spot that it uses for spot metering. Now, by default, that is the center focus point on your camera, but depending on your camera, it might move with your focus point. Regardless, it is metering on one single tiny spot and ignoring everybody else in the frame. What that means is you need to put that spot on the subject that you want to meter for. And if you do that and you set your exposure and then you move your camera to lock your focus in, the meter is going to read off of the new spot that you've pointed it at, which means that the exposure indicator is going to give you a reading that doesn't match up with what you just had. It might read plus one or plus three or minus three. It totally depends on the subject and the scene that you're shooting. If you're using manual exposure, then you don't have to worry about locking the exposure because you have already set your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO for the subject when you point at the spot at the subject you are shooting. However, if you're using aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode or program auto, when you move the camera and it re-meters, it will actually change the settings on you to maintain a zero exposure. To avoid that, what you would need to do is use the exposure lock function. It depends on your camera, so I can't say exactly how to do it for each camera out there. But the basics are that you either already have a button set for this function or you can program a button on your camera for the exposure lock function, which means when you press the button, after you've got the camera metering off the subject you want it to meter for, it will lock the exposure and the exposure will not change until you unlock it or take a photo with the camera. So that's how you would handle locking your exposure when you're using spot metering and you're moving the camera around. Now our last question this week comes from Mary Ann who's looking at buying a camera and she's wondering about megapixels and resolution and what's standard and what's better and what's not better and all that confusing stuff about megapixels. One of the specifications she's looking at is 24.2 megapixels versus 18 megapixels and she wants to know what that means and if one is better than the other. Now I'm not going to go into huge depth but basically the megapixels dictate how large you can print your photo and the more megapixels you have the bigger you can print your photo. Now Canon just released a 50 megapixel DSLR which is kind of ridiculous. You can print photos that are like billboard sized with that camera. It's just crazy. If you are printing normal size photos. We're talking like 8x10, 8x12, 11x14 as your largest prints. 18 megapixels is plenty good. In a nutshell, 24.2 is not necessarily better than 18. What you need to do is figure out what is your largest print size that you intend to print, and then if you need 24.2 megapixels to print at that size, get the 24.2 megapixel camera. If not, 18 will be fine. Now, the second part of her question has to do with resolution, and she says, the camera that I'm looking at has a resolution of 6,016 by 4,000 pixels pixels and is that standard or is that good? It is not necessarily standard or good or bad. That is just the dimensions of the megapixels of the camera. So that is directly related to the 24.2 megapixels or the 18 megapixels and there's no standard per se although as of right now we're generally in the 18 to 24 megapixel range for sort of standard DSLR cameras out there. All right I hope you guys enjoyed this week's Q&A and if you have any questions for me, leave them down in the comments. And then do me a favor, would you like this video and subscribe to my channel? If you really like this video, maybe share it with your friends. But the most important thing you need to do is get out there, take some damn photos already. I'll see you guys on Tuesday.